Thank you. It's going to be a very, very brief overview, actually, because um, I, I think uh, what I'm going to do is try and codify some of the things that you've just said. I just want where we're coming from is essentially to, to say that informal markets are essentially created by failures or distortions in the formal markets. Um, and a lot of what we're regulating through medicine regulation is, is products, but there's very little regulation of markets. And we need to think about how markets are regulated and how incentives are regulated um, to really understand that. So I guess that's where I'm coming from. Great. Um, so with, with that in mind, I understand that um, you have done a recent analysis that discussed factors that can actually reduce uh, drug quality. And could you explain a little bit about that? Yeah, so I am not a specialist in regulation by any stretch of the imagination. I'm an epidemiologist, and what I care about is treating people with drugs that work, and we found that we were treating people with drugs that didn't work. So that raised the question, why are there drugs that don't work in the market? Um, and we did uh, an analysis in, in four countries, China, uh, Indonesia, Turkey, and Romania. And from that built a, a framework which really tries to disentangle the forces, the political and the economic forces, which are facilitating uh, or pushing markets for substandard uh, and degraded products and for falsified products. And what we found basically is you've essentially got two different things going on. You've got, and they're all, we go, everything goes back to politics, and all politics is local. So essentially, and I think that the absence of our sponsors, the FDA in this room, will remind us of that fact. Um, so uh, you've got political promises around, that essentially dominate the demand side for medicines, and those are mostly around, um, around universal health coverage these days in all countries except for this one. Um, so they're around citizen health and universal health coverage. Policies that enact that are policies around health financing and procurement. And there are many different bodies that enact that that have different interests. Now, in most countries, that demand side is broadly socialist in its outlook. We're trying to deliver the greatest number, of, the greatest amount of access to effective medicines to the greatest number of people at the most affordable cost. On the supply side, you've got a lot of other promises around national prosperity, which are about the tax base, which are about trade policy, which are about industrial policy, which are about America first or Indonesia first or India first, which we're hearing in more and more countries. And those are also enacted through policies, environmental policies, trade policies, industrial <laughs> policy, and that affects the supply side, but those are almost entirely affecting the uh, the uh, pharmaceutical industry, so manufacturers and distributors, and that side of the equation is entirely capitalist. So we've got this kind of mash in the middle, um, which essentially the, the demand side is trying to push prices down as much as it can. The regulation on the supply side is pushing costs up. In between are the companies that are trying to deliver shareholder value and maximize their uh, or protect their margins. So you've got this distortion. Now, the way that plays out in the countries that we've been looking at is those cost containment things have a direct effect on production, particularly production for local markets. So there's a cut in production costs, there's a cut in distribution costs, and those lead direct, directly to a risk of substandard uh, production and to a greater risk of degradation. So that's one thing that goes on in the um, in w the direct effect of uh, of um, the pressure for lower prices. But another thing happens as well, and this comes back to some of the distortions that you're talking about in the market, which is the private companies say, "Okay, well." we're not going to sell into that market anymore because it's simply not profitable for us. Because the cost of entering that market, the cost of, 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 um, of registering our product, et cetera, doesn't make us enough money. We're not going to do it. Distributors engage in arbitrage, particularly within single markets like the European market. So, you know, Romania promises to have the lowest medicine prices in Europe, but it's in a single market. So, of course, all the, all the quality assured medicines in Romania end up in Germany where they sell for three times the cost, and that creates a vacuum which, as, as you can see here, it creates shortages and unmet demand. And I'm not talking about unmet need. I'm talking about unmet demand. 
That's also prompted by pharmaceutical companies that are marketing their products aggressively into the more um, the more profitable uh, markets and into the more profitable sectors of those markets. So you've got healthcare service providers who are actively uh, selling up but selling people up onto off-plan drugs. It happens in this country and in many others. So you're creating markets that create an unmet demand, even where that need is met by generic lower-cost drugs, and that creates a market opportunity for falsification. So you've got these two very, very different um, mechanisms, but they happen at the interface of the demand side and the supply side, and the role of the mechanism regulator in this... So let's go to that question, which is um, you have uh, maybe a different view of the the recommendation to invest in local regulators, or is that is that not fair? Um, it's uh, a bit like you. You need medicine regulation. You need strong, well-financed medicine regulators. That's absolutely sure. But let's look at what regulators do. So I've just marked three things here, which I think are the biggest function of national regulatory authorities. You've got GMP and GDP inspection. Where that is well done, it can cut the... Um, relationship between downward pressure on uh, prices and substandard production. Because however low you push push your production costs, if you've got decent GMP standards, then it's not going to result in a substandard uh, product. If you've got good GDP standards and those are followed, you're not going to result in degradation. So that's a very, very important function. The other two major things that regulators do, and Google will correct me if I'm wrong, but is um, is post-market surveillance and product registration. Product registration and market authorization, and I've put those as dotted lines because they're incredibly porous. Actually, market authorization, which is something that a lot of national regulatory authorities dedicate a lot of time and attention to because it's where they make their money, so that's how they sustain themselves, right, actually does very little to disrupt any of these pathways that allow for substandard and falsified markets in the product. Post-market surveillance is even more porous. So I'd like to go back to something that, that um, Jude brought up earlier, which is um, the, uh, the potential for uh, better targeted post-market surveillance. I think we should be doing risk-based post-market surveillance. I think the USP has a very good tool for that. But I think you should add to that tool a political economy analysis because this is an analysis that you can do for specific products in specific markets. So you can say, oh, wait, that product, which and we've, we've started to quantify this, and actually one of my students has a fellowship from USP to take this work forward um, in Indonesia. Um, so we're going to be trying to quantify these things to say, okay, if the international reference price, if, if a local product, because of lo- domestic procurement policies, because it's on the list for the National Universal Health Insurance, the product price has fallen by 68% in two years. It's gone from being on a par with the international reference price to being only 10% of the international reference price. You're like, right there, there's cost cutting going on. When you see international generics companies pulling out of a market because they cannot make a living, because they cannot go on making products at quality and still make a profit, then you need to start thinking about doing more post-market surveillance of the domestic alternatives. So I think that we can use this sort of analysis to think more about the thing. And I just want to finish up by saying it's really important to recognize that these, these, and it's something that goes back to what what you've been saying also about um, the level at which regulation um, takes place. And I think that uh, Spencer also said this. Most of these policies are regulated nationally. So they're driven by national political priorities and they're driven by national regulation. But the supply side, that's a global calculus because most large producers, including producers of generic medicines, are making a global calculus. So we've got a regulation at the national level uh, of products, but a regulation of markets 
at the international level. What does that mean? It means that countries like China, countries like India, are producing for export, small number of countries producing for a very large number of exporting markets, but our current regulation means that there's absolutely no onus on the domestic regulator to assure the quality of those products. So India does not do quality assurance for products that are for export unless the importing country requires them to. And the large majority of low and in, in middle income countries that are importing from India and China and four or five other large producers, the onus is on them to do the QC, not on those four or five countries that are doing most of the production. So just in terms of, of, of politically of course, because of national sovereignty and et cetera. You know, that's a legacy from, uh, from, from previous um, times. But in terms of what would be rational, it would be much more rational to put more emphasis on, as the United States is now doing, but as low and middle income countries are not well equipped to do, to put more emphasis on regulation, of, on building in quality, as was, as was said yesterday many times, to products at the point of production, and less emphasis on individual national medicine regulators doing a caveat emptor uh, type um, regulation. Well, can I just comment Please. then on the market authorization? The point that was made by Lembit yesterday about building in quality into the product. If you are not, if you have a robust marketing authorization system that looks at the quality attributes of the product carefully and you understand what you're doing, I think it is possible for you, for the products that you give marketing authorization to, to be reasonably quality products and then you buttress that with doing GMP. We understand that the major manufacturers are not going to do the quality assessments on our behalf. So we find ourselves actually having to go to those markets to actually do particularly the GMP inspections because that's one of the things also to give yourself assurance that there's quality that is built into that uh, process of uh, manufacturing. So those two, I, we think, are key. Absolutely, they are absolutely key. I guess my um, my point is that at the moment we're requiring that of 192 countries, where most of the production for many of those countries is concentrated in a very small number of countries. So if we shifted the burden of proof, as the airline industry has done, for example, on the exporting country, it would mean less work, and Zimbabwe is well-resourced, as you said, you've got a very effective uh, regulator, but that's not true of a very large number of, of countries. Right. And that could also, in part, be accomplished through some level of harmonization, I'm assuming, yeah. yeah. 